Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome to my first video of the 2024-25 FPL season. In today's video, we'll have my reaction to the launch, some of the big rule changes and also my first draft as well. If you are very excited for the start of FPL and the start of the content here on this channel, please do smash that like button and if you are new around here, make sure to subscribe as well. But without further ado, let's jump into it. I'm not gonna lie guys, I'm like an excitable child. It's like it's Christmas day. Christmas Eve is yesterday. We were thinking about the launch, looking at all the price reveals. Today's Christmas day, I'm opening up my presents. And these are my initial, this is a terrible analogy. These are my, my initial thoughts around kind of the general pricing, the structure, the changes to FPL with respect to the rules. And then we'll go into my draft because I think some of my general thoughts around FPL will impact the way that I've built my current draft. And I should just note, this is just my initial reaction. Obviously, this has gone out straight after the game's been launched. So we'll tinker throughout preseason, and I'm sure we'll fine tune on our, our thought process and, the, and that final draft as well. So I think there have been a few changes to FPL, but the biggest one is that you can now roll up to five transfers. So if you've not been in the loop and you've not been seeing, you can now roll up to five transfers. And then obviously at that point, it becomes almost like it used to be when you had two free transfers, you can't roll anymore. Now, my initial reaction to this was that I hate it and that I think it's massively overkill. And I think this would encourage inaction and kind of a boring play style where you build a really long-term team and then you just roll, 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 play a mini wild card. Roll, 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 play a mini. And, and that was my initial reaction. But maybe it won't be like that because someone did make a good point. When can you really usually roll up to five free transfers? There are often points where we've got two free transfers and ideally, we don't really need to use a transfer we could do with rolling again. But you often roll up to five. I don't think that will happen too often. And the other thing to say is that's not necessarily a good thing. There have been plenty of times when I've rolled a transfer and actually using that transfer would have been a good thing. So I, maybe it's not as bad as I first thought. And I would love to know down below, what do you think about this? Is this something that you think is good? Would you have liked to have seen three? Would you prefer it stayed as two. I think the real reason they've done this, if we're being honest with ourselves, is probably for the more casual managers that often will forget about their team for a month at a time. They can come back and they can fix their team. Because if you forgot about your team for four to five weeks, well, then there was very little you could do because you still only had two free transfers. I do think this will change the way that we approach blanks and doubles because often you'd have to make loads of transfers in advance ahead of a blank or double game week because you could still only have two transfers, obviously, on that week. But now, you could roll, 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 right up to a blank game week and essentially bring in five, six, even seven players for a couple of hits into your team. So I do think this will change the way we play FPL. I've said here, I think it might lend itself to building slightly longer term than usual, but it may allow us to take risky punts because let's say you've rolled transfers and you've now got four free transfers. Well, if you take a risky one-week punt, you drop down to three free transfers you can still fix that, right? So it might actually lend itself to some riskier punts, which might be nice. So I could talk about that for half an hour in itself, but I think that is a big change. The other thing is there have been some changes to the bonus point system, which we'll cover in more detail in the future. But one that was of note is shots on target now positively contribute towards the bonus system. And this makes sense because shots off target have always negatively affected bonus. So I think shots on target sh should, right? You're almost scoring a or at least testing the goalkeeper. So I think this will affect players that take lots of shots and get those shots on target. So I will flash up on screen. There was a brilliant graphic from Mark over at Blackbox. If you type in FPL Blackbox on any audio streaming platform or on YouTube, they do some fantastic work. And you can see here, this is a list of players that have been good for shots on target and those that will be positively affected, I suppose, by the change in the bonus point system, such as Watkins, Foden, Haaland. If Darwin can get more of his shots on target than off target, etc. So this is something which will now incorporate into our decision making. I don't think it's going to massively affect it. I'm not saying that taking shots on target now means they are definitely going to be in my team, but it will positively affect their chance for bonus point if they get four shots on target in a single game, unless they're missing big chances, of course. Now, so those are the two big rule changes. There is, of course, this mystery chip that is going to be available in January, but that doesn't affect the way we build our team right now. The next thing to note is that Haaland is in at 15 million, right? And I think that is extremely highly priced. And as you can imagine, as someone that went without Haaland at various points last season, my initial instinct is that's just not worth it, even with captaincy considered, and even with this addition for players that take shots on target, which Haaland often does. And even with the addition of five free transfers, because I think it will be easy to, to move in and out of those premium assets. It's just, it's so much money. To put that into perspective, it's six million more than Ollie Watkins. It's 
double the price of Mateta, Tony, Solanke. Like, it, it's not just an extortion. That's ridiculously highly priced. And I love it because there will still be people that think it's worth it. And I may well go with him, but they've priced him at a point where you can honestly look at that and say that's too much money. Because if he was 14, you're still kind of like, that's 5 million more than what kids you could probably... That extra million goes a long way, but 15 million? Initial instinct is it's not worth it, which is a spoiler for the actual draft. The next thing to note is there are several... I've called them semi-premiums this year. You've got Saka, KDB, Foden, Palmer, Watkins, Son. I've probably missed one there. But these are those players that are 9 million and above. We've obviously got Palmer in at 10.5 as well, Son in at 10. So these are... I've called them semi-premiums. You could even call them premiums. But in the past, you could have squeezed Saka, KDB, Foden, Palmer, Watkins, Son, and maybe even Haaland into a team last season. You just can't do that this season. I would say there's a very small chance you can even get three of these in. Maybe you can squeeze three, but obviously that means no Haaland. If you want to go Haaland and you want to go Salah, I would argue you maybe can't even get one, maybe maximum one, but you have to sacrifice elsewhere. So I think the big decision and maybe sadly the big swing at the start of the season is going to be, do you nail which semi-premium to pick? Do you go for Palmer or Saka? And how does that affect your score? So that will be a large amount of the analysis in pre-season, I would imagine. And I'm going to do some deep dives into which players I think are worth it with the fixtures and the data. But I think nailing those kind of semi-premiums, I'll call them for now, I think that was probably going to be the most important thing in our teams. There are lots of good 4.5 million pound defenders, which I like. So for example, Konza, Gay, Martinez, Van der Ven, there are more Dunk, which we'll discuss in a second. I think all of these are really nice. And I like the fact that FPL have done this because clean sheets are less common now. And all of the defenders that I've noted don't have much attacking threat. So it's like, yeah, you've got some decent defenders that might keep clean sheets for 4.5, but they've obviously not got the attacking threat to go with it and clean sheets aren't as common. So is it worth making that sacrifice or should you go for three really solid defenders at 5 million or more? And I like the fact that they've done that because I think that gives us some decisions to make. The final thing is we do have some expensive defenders, notably probably White, Gavardio and Trent would be the main three. White at 6.5 and Trent at 7, they're very expensive. We'll discuss them in more detail in a second. Gavardio at 6 seems like really good value, but it's going to be, again, when you've got all of these Saka, KDB, Foden, Palmer, Watkinson, all of these players you want to own, you've got Haaland as well, you've got Salah, who's not even been mentioned here. Can you afford to squeeze in even one expensive defender, let alone two? And if you can't have two, are you saying you're going without Arsenal defence or without one of Guardiola or Trent? So there are some extremely difficult decisions to make. And before we even look at my team, the thing that I have noted is that the pricing, in my opinion, at the moment, I might change my opinion on this when I tinker more, but I think the pricing is much, much better than it was last season. And maybe this addition of up to three, five free transfers is a good thing. My initial instinct is love the pricing, not a massive fan of the five threes. I would have preferred it to be three. But with all of that excitement and me speaking at an even quicker pace than usual, let's now take a look at my first draft for this season. So guys, without further ado, let's take a look at that first draft. So a couple of things before I start. This is my first draft. I've obviously been planning this for a while now. I've actually had the draft ready to go from the prize reveals, but the game is literally just launched when I'm recording this and it bloody took its time. But the game is just launched and therefore... I haven't thought about all of the permutations. I've not looked at rotating fixtures. I've not looked into the data for specific players. So this is just a first initial draft just to give you something to watch and just to get us back into FPL. So I'm sure you will pick out lots of issues with it and please do let me know. But obviously I will take more care in submitting my final team. And what I've got is next to me, I've got a note of some of the other players that I was trying to squeeze into the draft that I just couldn't manage to do. And I've also got the website open, ready to maybe just look at some player prices to remind myself. So bear with me. But this is the first draft. So I have used all 100 million. Most of the time I do. A common question that I often get is, do you need to? Absolutely not, by the way. It's really useful if you save 0 0.5. And let me tell you why. If you start with someone like Luke Shaw and you're thinking, well, I've got Luke Shaw, but I can move to another 5 million defender if Luke Shaw doesn't perform well. Well, what happens if Luke Shaw drops in price and the other 5 million option that you want to move to, let's say Rhys James, probably not, they rise in price. Well, then you're 0.2 million off just like that, right? So you can't make that move. So having that 0.5 buffer can be very helpful, but it's very difficult this year. So I have used the full budget and I'm currently lining up in a 3-5-2, but I do really like the 3-4-3 as well. So with all of that put together, here is the current draft. In goal... At the moment, I've just got Verbruggen and a 4 million keeper. I've got Turner. It'll almost definitely not be Turner. Hopefully, a 4 million pound goalkeeper will arise that we know will start every week. And I don't think Turner will be that. It will be Sells. But 
I think a 4.5 and a 4 is a nice structure to go with for now because there are some really nice 4 million pound options. I think Verbruggen and Flecken are probably the two most likely for me, but I do like Sells and I also like the idea of a Crystal Palace goalkeeper as well. So I'm not going to fixate on the goalkeepers too much for the time being. More so just I like the 4.5 goalkeepers because they always tend to be the best value. Sometimes you'll get a 5 million or a 5.5 that score really well but I just prefer to use that elsewhere because the thing is you need good chance for a clean sheet. But you also need a good chance for save points. And often those 4.5s do that. So for me, I'm probably deciding at the moment between Verbruggen, Flecken, maybe Sells and maybe a Crystal Palace goalkeeper, Johnston or Henderson. I think it will be Henderson that the Crystal pa that is the Crystal Palace number one, but we don't know that yet. So goalkeeper situation, probably the, the position I'm most unsure about, but I like that structure. Let me know down below if you think you might pay a little bit extra to go for someone like Onana or Pickford at 5 million. I think that's their price. In defense, I've kind of gone relatively expensive because my cheapest starting defender is actually 5 million, but I've also not got lots of expensive defenders. We spoke about earlier on that maybe defenders will find it slightly harder to get bonus points. And also a lot of those expensive defenders don't necessarily have the most attacking threat. Before I even discuss the three that I've got, let's talk about the players that are missing. The first being Trent Alexander-Arnold, and I absolutely hate that I don't have him for a couple of reasons. I think under Arnie Slot, he's going to play quite an attacking role where he actually inverts, but I don't think it'll be inverting into kind of central defensive midfield. I think it will be almost inverting into like a defensive number eight role where he's still getting forward a fair amount and he's occupying that space between the center of the pitch and sort of that right wing position. So I think he'll actually be potentially even better under Arnie Slot. We don't know that, but I like the idea of where he might be playing. And also the fixtures are just unbelievable. And it's the cheapest price I think he's been since like 2019, 20. So I do really want Trent, but he's very expensive. And when you look at the other players I've got, I, just, I don't want to downgrade any of them. So I'm fully aware Trent should be in there. And by the time you see my next draft, he may well be. Other players, Arsenal defense. I don't have a single Arsenal defender here. And that hurt me so many times last season. And you're probably thinking, Ross, when will you learn? And the answer is probably never. My issue with Arsenal defence, right, is Ben White is 6.5. I'll discuss Cavadio in a second. I don't want to pay the extra 0 0.5 at the moment, especially when you look at Arsenal's fixtures. And then when I look at someone like Saliba being the same price, price as Cavadio, do I think Saliba's got enough about him? I mean, the clean sheets are great, and he's been very good for bonus points in the past, but he's never demonstrated great attacking threat. And that's when maybe someone like Gabriel comes in. But Arsenal looking to bring in a new centre-back, probably almost definitely, the likes of Zinchenko, Timber, I mean, who's going to start for them? I think Saliba's the only nailed one, and I'm just not sure he carries enough attacking threat. So that's why at the moment, the two bigger missions of Trent and Arsenal defence aren't there, but I will try to, in the coming days and weeks, find ways that I can get them in, because in an ideal world, I would have Saliba and I would have Trent. I think the only other option at maybe a slightly, att uh, slightly more expensive price is maybe Porro. Uh, I mean, I think he'll be great for bonus points now. I think he was brilliant at points last season. He's on set pieces. I think Spurs will improve slightly defensively, but can I squeeze him in at 5.5? It is difficult. So let's discuss the defenders that I've actually got. The most expensive, expensive, I can't give a word. I'm so excited. The most expensive is Guardio at 6 million. Not the best opening set of fixtures. And by the way, new addition to the graphics this season. I've got some of the, the further fixtures to come up. So you can see Chelsea, Ipswich, West Ham, Brentford, Arsenal. I like that Ipswich fixture in game week two. It's really just how he finished the season last year. If he even gets close to that, he'll make a mockery of his price tag because clean sheets will happen for Man City. Maybe not as often as we expect them to, but they do keep a lot of clean sheets. And he was just unbelievably attacking, even if he plays a slightly more defensive version of that role. I think 6 million is too cheap. I think Vardyol should have come in at 6.5. And as a result, if I think it's too cheap, then maybe he's the premium defender for, to, to go for. So at the moment, I've got Guardiola in. Not the best opening fixture, though, and it could be that he becomes someone like Saliba, Ben White, or Trent in the future. I've then got two five millions, and I do like this price tag because you get a bit of an attacking threat, but it's obviously slightly more uh, expensive than those 4.5s. Munoz, unbelievably good at points last season, especially for attacking threat. And for Colombia, the man scores goals for fun. He's very, very attacking, and I think Crystal Palace will continue to look very good defensively. Yes, they lost Elise, which might affect their output in the attack, but defensively, I expect them to continue to look very good. Looks like they will keep Gay at least at the time of me recording this. I just think Munoz could offer a lot. He's very attacking. We'll dive into the numbers in future videos, but I like the look of him a lot. And then Luke Shaw, massive Manchester United bias. Of course, I'm a Man United fan, but five million is a good price. 
I was hoping he would be five rather than 5.5. And yeah, I'm looking at it and just thinking the fixtures aren't great, but he's good for bonus points usually. He'll carry some attacking threat. And I just think that people have forgotten how good Luke Shaw can be due to his injuries. But is it best to start with him when he is an injury risk and the fixtures aren't great? I do think that that Luke Shaw spot might end up being someone else. But for now, I really like Luke Shaw. I suppose the issue that we've got with Munoz and Luke Shaw is you've got some really good options from both teams at 4.5. So rather than Munoz, I could go for Gay, And rather than Shaw, I could go for Lissandro Martinez. I would then save myself a million where I could go from Gvardiol to Trent. So, I mean, answer this question down below. Munoz, Gvardiol, Shaw, or Gay, Trent, and Lissandro Martinez, or another 4.5 defender, maybe it's not worth going for those 5 millions. But I just like the additional attacking threat, especially if they do get additional things for fouls one, for shots on target in the new bonus point system. I think they could gather quite a lot of bonus points. In terms of 4.5 million pound defenders, at the moment, I've got Consa on the bench. I like Consa because his fixtures from game week three onwards are really strong. And that's around when the likes of Shaw and Munoz have difficult fixtures, right? So you can see in game week three, Munoz has Chelsea. In game week three, Luke Shaw has Liverpool. I've already thought about this a lot. Consa in game week three has a nice set of fixtures from there. I can't, it's too small, like Leicester, Everton, Wolves, something like that. So he's got a nice run of fixtures. So I like the idea of rotating him in. But there are other really good 4.5s. I've already spoken about Crystal Palace and Manchester United. I also like uh, Van der Ben from Spurs. I like Lewis Dunk. I think could really be good. At points last season, Brighton started to show signs of defending well, but then they didn't. But under new management, and he has traditionally had very, very good attacking threat. So I like the idea of Dunk in there. But I just think fixtures-wise, it kind of aligns with me. Conser, I think his fixtures start at a really nice point. I've then got Harwood Bellis. I'll be entirely honest, I know nothing about the promoted teams. I will do my research, of course, but it sounds like he has a starting spot in that Saints team and he's 4 million. So I think I'll probably have a promoted 4 million pound defender in that slot there. So there we go. That is the defense. I managed to do that in under 10 minutes. I'm pretty proud of myself. So that's the situation at the moment. Basically, I, I know I need to squeeze an Arsenal defender in there. I, I should try to, and I should probably try to squeeze Trent in there, but it's not easy. So let's now take a look at the five-man midfield. If you're still watching the video at this point, thank you very much. And again, if you are new, please do consider subscribing. It really helps me out and make sure you drop a like on the video. But also, I should have said at the start of the video, make sure to join my mini league as well. The code is above me and I'll try and flash it on screen in something a little bit bigger for you for, to see, which is KNBG94. Make sure to join the mini league. I do really appreciate it. So the midfield, I can almost guarantee you this is the part of the video that will get the most controversy because there are so many good midfielders to choose from at different price points and it's difficult to squeeze them all in. So I will go through the options that I've chosen. But again, I've got a list here of, I think like eight or nine midfielders that I would really like to get in also. And there's probably some that I've not even considered enough at this point that I would also like to, to bring in. So it's not easy. I think depending on if you have Haaland or not, it can become easier or harder. And again, looking at what you can see now, you can obviously tell I don't have Erling Haaland in this first draft, which I'll discuss in a second, which means that I can get Salah in. Right, so Salah is the one, I think even if you've got Haaland, you should probably try to get Salah. Look at the opening fixtures. They've got Ipswich, Brentford, Man United, Forest, Bournemouth. The fixtures continue up until about game week eight or nine to be very, very good for Liverpool. So I don't think you should sacrifice Salah if you have Haaland. I think Salah is that first name in the team sheet for me. Let's see how they look under Arnie Slot in pre-season, but I like the look of Salah and he'll be my captain in game week one almost definitely. So that's kind of an obvious pick, I suppose, especially given I don't have Haaland. Outside of that, there are some brilliant options. I've actually tried here, not confirmed. All five should be on penalties this season. I think penalty takes are massive, maybe less this season because there were so many last season, but it's always nice to have that additional roots to points, I think. And Eze, Palmer, Salah, Gibbs, White, Fernandez, they should all be on penalties. I think Eze and Palmer and Fernandez almost guaranteed to be on pens, right? Palmer could have them taken off by Nkunku, but... I think those three should be on pens. Gibbs, White, and Salah, I'm not so sure. I mean, Salah's penalty record isn't perfect by any means. They've got some really good penalty takers in that team. And Gibbs, White, we've seen Chris Wood take some in the past. So maybe not, but all five should be on pens. So Salah's basically a lock for me. I don't think I'll change that in pre-season. After that, I then think with my current structure, structure, I basically have to choose one of Palmer, Foden, or Saka. And I think a lot of people are going to be in this position. And I would love to know down below in the comments... If you can only have one of Palmer, Saka, or Foden, and I know you can change them, of course, but let's say you have to hold them for the first four to five game weeks, who would you prefer out of the three? It's obviously Palmer is the most expensive, but he's the one I've gone for at the moment. 
And it's this kind of like talisman theory, right? I think the goals will be a lot more spread out at Manchester City and at Arsenal. Whereas with Chelsea, I'm not saying other players won't get goals. I'm sure they will. But you kind of fancy Palmer to be involved in absolutely everything that Chelsea do. And while Saka is first choice penalty taker, I'd be so surprised if Nkunku gets pens. I think Palmer's going to take pretty much all of them because he didn't miss last season. He's an excellent penalty taker. So you've got to imagine that Palmer will continue to take all of the pens. Foden's not even on penalties. I just think everything points towards, for me, Palmer being that guy for Chelsea. And we saw in the Euros when he got minutes, he was exceptional. And I would be lying if I said that didn't impact my thinking because when he came on, he... I say he's different gravy. I said it on Twitter, he's different gravy. And what I mean by that is he just... When he has the ball, you just think something will happen. And I'm not saying that's not the case with Foden and Saka, but... Purely from an FPL perspective, I fancy Palmer to get more attacking returns and points than I do Foden and Saka. But as you can see here, I've got no Arsenal players at the moment. So getting Saka in there might be nice just to get some Arsenal coverage. I think I'll probably maybe even do an entire video looking at Palmer, Saka and Foden in more detail because it's very, very close. But for me, Palmer's just got the nod at the moment because I just think he'll be that guy for Chelsea. But he did get a lot of penalties last year. If you take away some of those pens and say he only got four or five penalties rather than the nine that I think he got, maybe maybe I'd be thinking Saka's the guy to go for. I'd love to know down below. I'm, I'm obviously, this is very fresh at the moment. And I'm still thinking about it, but Palmer just feels like that guy for me. So once I've got Palmer and Salah in there in this current structure, I then can afford an 8.5 million pound midfielder. I'm going to get a lot of stick in the comments. That one at the moment is currently Bruno Fernandes. And the only reason for that is he's so nailed and he's definitely on penalties. Outside of that, yeah, there's a bit of Man United bias, but he is a good FPL option because he will continue to get attacking returns. And I like what I'm seeing from Manchester United in the transfer market. And I've got a feeling there will, I don't think we're finishing top two or top three by any means, but I think there will be improvements in the way that we play. So I think Fernandes could be really nice, especially combining with Xerxes as well. I think it's a player that will, improve the amount of returns that Fernandez gets. So I've got him in there at the moment, but at that 8.5 million pound price tag, Martin Erdegaard is sat there. And again, that will give me some Arsenal attacking coverage. He is pretty good from FPL perspective, but at points last season was playing a little bit deeper than I would have wanted. So that's why I've got Fernandez at the moment because Erdegaard doesn't have penalties or at least not consistently. The date is better for Fernandez, and the minutes may be slightly better for Fernandez, but they're both very, very now. So I do like Martin Odegaard. I've got him noted down. He's been in cut quite a few of my drafts, and I've been tinkering before the game was even live. So I do like him. Other options, though, at 8.5, not let me actually have a look because I could be lying here, but I don't think if we sort by price on the official site. Yeah, 8.5, there is no one. It's just those two. You can obviously go up to 9.5, Foden and De Bruyne. And then after that, it's the 7.5. So we've got no one at 8.5 other than those two and no one at 8. At 7.5, there are some really good options. You've got Luis Diaz. You've got Diogo Jota if you think they'll start. But the one that I'm really eyeing up is Anthony Gordon. The opening fixtures are really good. Arguably up there with Liverpool as the best opening fixtures, especially game week one against Southampton at home. We know how good Gordon was at home last season. I have toyed with the idea of having Gordon in that Fernandez spot, which gives me a million to potentially do something like Shaw to Saliba. If I was to pose to you, and I can guarantee this, Shaw and Fernandez or Saliba and Gordon, you will probably say Saliba and Gordon, and maybe you're right. So that is also an option for me, is to just go for Gordon in that spot. But for now, I've gone Palmer, Salah, Fernandez. Then budget-wise, because I'm really happy with my forwards, which I'll discuss in a second, that left me with 13.5 million for the Eze and Gibbs White spots. You can do this a couple of ways. Obviously, you could go for two 6.5s and then have a bit to spare. You could go for a 7.5 and a 6, but what I've chosen to do here is go for a 7 and a 6.5 for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I just love Everetti Eze. I think he'll have a really good season. I'm hoping that the departure, the departure of Elise doesn't massively affect Crystal Palace's attacking threat, but they've made some good signings already, and I expect them to be very, very strong this season under Glasner. They were so good towards the back end of last season. If you didn't watch my content last season, by the way, in game week 38, I brought in Eze, and he got me 18 points in game week 38. So he's, he's a bit of a hero for me, and I just love him. And he should almost definitely be on penalties. Now that Elise is not there, there was some confusion last year as, as to who would be on pens. I think at 7 million, he's really nice. And the other reason that I like him is I think there are tons of really good 6.5 million pound midfielders, as we'll discuss in a second. And so I think if you start with Eze, even if he falls in price because he has a stinker in the opening two, you can downgrade him to any number of 6.5s that look really good in the first couple of game weeks. 
So for me, Eze is not only a brilliant option in and of himself, but he's also at a very good price point. So Eze is up there for me as a really nice option. Now at that 6.5 price tag, just looking here on the official site, so Declan Rice, not really. Bailey, DRB looks like he's leaving. Bailey was really good when he played last year. As long as his minutes are slightly better, Bailey could be brilliant. You've got Matoma, I think could be a really nice option if he can stay fit. And Kunku looks to be the best 6.5. And I think if you're not going for Palmer, or maybe even if you are, in Kunku at a 6.5 million pound mid, I think at some point this season will make a mockery of that price tag. Let's see what happens in preseason. I mean, there are loads of options. You've got Doku and Bernardo Silva, Grealish, Rodri, lots of Man City options at a cheaper price. Garnacho. If I didn't have Fernandez, Garnacho could be good, especially with fouls one and shots on target contributing towards the bonus. Harvey Barnes, if he gets enough minutes. But the one that I've currently got at the moment is Gibbs White. And the reason for that is penalties, I think, should take them. And those opening three fixtures are really good for Forrest. And then I can pivot away to another midfielder that I want. So Bournemouth, Southampton, Wolves. After that, the fixtures do deteriorate. But I quite like the idea of taking a, a shorter punt in that midfield when the rest of my plays you could conceivably keep longer term. So yeah, that's why I've got Gibbs White at the moment. Let me know what you think of that. You could even go for hudson Adoy, who I think is 5.5, if I'm correct, which I thought was very cheap if he gets enough minutes. Yeah, 5.5. So if you still want a Forest attacker, but you don't have 6.5, you could go there. Or, as we'll discuss in a second, you could drop Gibbs White and you could go for a 3-4-3 instead and just have those four midfielders. So, obviously, I'm missing a few players. On my list, Saka and Foden are the top two. I would love to get them in, but I've chosen Palmer instead. Son, I've not even mentioned Spurs attack. Brennan Johnson could be an okay option. Son could be really nice, but again, I've chosen Palmer instead. Erdegaard and Gordon, we discussed. Garnacho, Bailey, and hudson Adoy. So yeah, those are the midfielders that are currently in my brain at, at the moment. Let me know if you think I've missed anyone. I almost definitely have missed someone. Brian and Bermo comes to mind as an option that I might have missed. But I like these five. They're pretty good for minutes. In fact, they're very good for minutes. They should all be on penalties as well. They're all pretty talismanic for their teams. I really like them at full five. Midfield five, speak <laughs> speak English, Ross. So let's now take a look at the two forwards and discuss the team in its entirety. So moving on to the two forwards, and I currently have Watkins and Isaac. And this is where a lot of my budget is going. It's where I don't have Haaland because I just think the two of them were so good last season. They are fully justifying their, their increase in their price for both of them this season. And I just don't see that stopping for either, especially Izak. I just think he is going to be one of the best strikers the Premier League has ever seen. And I don't say that lightly. I think he is absolutely exceptional. And again, I've got a bit of a soft spot for him because I wildcarded, when was it? Game 30, 31 last season. And he just hauled week after week for me at quite a low ownership. I just think he's brilliant. And that, that fixture against Southampton at home, he's a genuine captaincy option in game week one. So I really want to have Izak in there. And Watkins is a, a very steep price. I built a few drafts having like Mateta or Tony or Solanke in there at 7.5 million. But I like the idea of Watkins because I think he's at such a price that a lot of people will go without. I don't think Watkins ownership will be as high as you think because 9 million is a lot. And if you can get someone like Solanke for 7.5, I can imagine a lot of people doing that so they can squeeze an Arsenal defender in. And that might be the right strategy. It might be that... Yeah, like Solanke and Saliba instead of Watkins and Shaw with a bit of money left over to do something else with it. Maybe that is a really nice strategy and I might end up on that. But yeah, I just think Watkins is at that price where he's, he's going to force a lot of people to not choose him, which makes me want to have him even more. I will dive into the data for the forwards because I think it's going to be interesting which forwards take a lot of shots and which forwards win a lot of fouls. Because if you take a lot of shots and you win a lot of fouls, especially on target, you'll be very good for bonus points. So yeah, I'll do more data diving in the future. Other forwards that I don't have, we'll discuss Haaland in a second. Havertz at 8 million, really nice price for him. He's sort of in between that Isaac price point and obviously Watkins price point and then down to the 7.5. So he stands alone at 8 million. But I mean, you can now see, and I'll discuss this in a second because it's awful. I don't have any Arsenal players. So Havertz could be a really nice inclusion for me. Like I said, Solanke, Tony, Mateta all at 7.5. Let's see where Tony moves to if he does. Solanke's not a sexy option at all, but he's a very safe option and the fixtures aren't awful for Bournemouth. Mateta may be overkill for me to have Munoz, Eze and Mateta, especially with Elise departing. And then Darwin and Gakpo. How good was Gakpo during the Euros? I mean, he was brilliant and Darwin maybe will look slightly better under Arnie Slot. I don't know if I'll be going for it from game week one because I just don't know who's going to start. They've got Diaz, they've got Jota, they've got Gakpo and they've got Darwin. Like who's starting in those positions? So I mean, there are tons of options. 
And then you've even got the cheaper options, right? Jao Pedro at 5.5. That is such a cheap price. If he looks like he's going to start every game, I could do Gibbs White to a cheaper midfielder and then go for a 3-4-3 with Jao Pedro. Maybe that's the best play. So, I mean, I've just rattled off loads of names at you, but I just think Watkins and Isaac just look so good. But yes, they're expensive. And yes, if you want Watkins and Isaac, you're not going to be having Haaland unless you're losing both Palmer and Salah, which seems crazy. So there are decisions to be made here. I just really like those two for the time being. So this is the team for the moment. <laughs> it's a first draft. I've noted here because it's just ridiculous when I think about it. I've got zero Arsenal players. I've got one Man City player and I've got one Liverpool player. That's that's awful, right? That makes no sense. They're the, the three best teams in the league. So that needs to change. That will be something that I'll be targeting my, in my next draft is I need more players from the best teams. Because I know FPL is not a team game. It's about how the individual player does, but it seems crazy. I've got no Man City attackers, only one Liverpool player and no Arsenal players. It, it just doesn't feel quite right. And you'll probably note that when you look at it. How can I have two Manchester United players and two Palace players when I've got zero from those teams? So yeah, that, that's what I need to work on. My first instinct is downgrade Fernandez to Gordon which will allow me to get someone like Saliba in or even upgrade Guardiola to Trent. My next instinct is, do I try and find a way to pivot Gibbs White into someone like Darwin or Gakpo? Could be an option. Or maybe I'd have to find 1.5 million, but Gibbs White into someone like Havertz in the attack and go for a 3-4-3. These are all the things that go around in my head at the moment. But I think in terms of first drafts, because we've got a month till the game goes live, I'm pretty happy with this. What I would love you to do, in addition to all of the other comments that I've asked throughout this video, give this team a very precise rating out of 10. Like, let's say 9.3. I don't think you'll be saying that, but I really like it. Just to note, you will see at the top, it says predicted points coming soon and team rating coming soon. I have partnered up once again with Fantasy Football Hub. I do believe it is the best site on the market for fantasy football statistics, player comparisons, articles, whatever you need and more. They will be doing 50% off during preseason if you use my code in the description. This is the best time to sign up because you get all of the use during preseason, but you also get the biggest discount as well. It will not last beyond preseason, usually anyway, the 50%. So get it while it lasts, get it whilst you can still make the most of it. And as of probably the time you're watching this, I expect the site to be live very, very soon with all of the new features. And I can tell you there are some exciting new features. So use the link in the description to sign up to Fantasy Football Hub. And thank you, Hub, as well for, for sponsoring me once again this season and supporting the channel. I do really appreciate it. And yeah, let me know what you think of my team down below. So guys, there you have it. That is my first video of the 2024-25 season. And do not worry, there'll be lots more content during pre-season. And if you have watched to this point and you are not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, please like the video first. But whilst you're down there, please also consider subscribing as well. I do really appreciate it. Until next time, thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.